Welcome to University of Greenwich webinars and to the first of a series of Park Cafes exploring concepts and actions around practices research and knowledge exchange. I'm Ghislaine Boddington and I'm a reader in digital immersion at the School of Design at the University of Greenwich. And the Park Cafes are brought to you by the Clay Research Group at University of Greenwich, which is a research group set up to look at co-creating aliveness in embodied immersion. And for Clay, for which I'm a co-director, we've obviously hit the practices research is very forward in, in all of our members work. And so we wanted to bring forward um, some discussions this year to help us all look at what practices research is, the different angles on it, the different meanings, not to look at solutions, but actually to look at what are the questions around this area. Um, and particularly now that REF21 is finished and we're moving forward, we don't know what the REF20 next ones will be, but we've got a bit of an open space and creative space to engage in this at this point. So, this webinar is um, leading up to a second um, park cafe, which is more of a workshop style one in March. And I will give you more details about that at the end of this webinar. So we're going to do a one hour webinar, fast input here. And um, you can see there at the bottom, you've got a chat box, please do add in there and a question and answers box. So I will be looking in the question and answers box for questions from any of you in the audience. And I also will uh, be um, do vote up any questions you want to bring forward. I may have to merge a few in, in the in the interest of time, but I will try and get these to our very special guests. And so back to today. Here we are. And I'm going to introduce to you Professor Gillian Youngs, who is actually a visiting professor with the University of Greenwich in um, the School of Design. And she's a professor of design and digital strategy. And Professor Pam Bernard, who is a Professor of Arts, Creativity and Education at the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge. So thank you two very much for joining us to share what I know is your senior knowledge, I'm going to call it, senior knowledge and wisdom about practice, about creativity and about what is impact out there. What is practice as research? How do we deal with knowledge exchange and what is this really weird, difficult word impact that floats around us. So, so both Gillian and Pam are going to present to, for 10 to 12 minutes, and we will get some of their inspirational, innovative thoughts on the topic of today. Um, and then I will come back to you with some questions, etc. Practice is research. Research is practice. Practice-led research, research-led practice. There's a lot of different phrases out there. Does it really matter? I think that we will bring this back up into discussion and add back in your questions from the question boxes then. So may I ask Gillian, first of all, to present to us her thinking around this topic. Thanks so much, Elaine. And um, I'm really happy to, to be here with you all and to share a little bit of my experience in the whole practice as research area. I'll start by saying that I am talking from direct experience and participant uh, participation in um, the research excellence framework and my work being submitted, including in impact case study. Um, I've also served on a REF panel and my area of expertise is related to the actual impact agenda. So um, I won't apologize for saying that impact is part of my passion and practices research is part of my uh, research, uh, both in an ambition and aspiration, as well as in practice. And you will find examples of, of my work on, on my LinkedIn page and uh, reports that I've written, which will uh, show you the kind of work I've been doing. So do refer to that if it's helpful. The first thing to say for me about practice as research, that in very simple terms, it does entail us thinking more about research as a practice. Uh, we have some assumptions around what research is that come from the structure of higher education, the history of higher education, and of course, um, frameworks like the research assessment exercise uh, that many of us have taken part in and the more recent research excellence um, uh, framework um, and what we will now have 
is the knowledge exchange framework. If I have a bit of time, I'll say something about that as well. So I think what has happened with the developing research agenda that's moved more towards what, what is often referred to as real world impact is um, a, a focus on stretching our understanding of excellence and what it means to be involved in research and excellent research. And I think what we might call uh, the new environment is one in which we're thinking in terms of stakeholder engagement in the pursuit of excellent outcomes. And those outcomes for me are about the service of research to real world outcomes. It's about collaboration and partnership work with stakeholders to achieve excellent outcomes. And it's very much about the relationship of research to different aspects of um, real world operations. And these, the important thing for me about these is that they can be incredibly diverse and they can come out of any area of research interest and expertise. It's all about just finding the right kind of stakeholders to engage with, ones that we believe in, that we trust, that, we're, that we feel are doing good work. And they may come from business, they may come from the policy area, they may come from the charity area, they may come from all sorts of activism. It, it's incredibly diverse um, and because, of course, impact relates to all these areas. So the way in which I tend to think of research as practice in the first instance is in terms of the different areas that research relates to in terms of achieving outcomes um, in real world contexts. And clearly policy is, is a really important area here. I'm quite lucky because for more than a decade now, my university roles have been involved in leadership in working across policy, research and business. So I'm quite lucky really because I've got a real stretch to the work that I do. But many of us work um, across different segments of that, if I might put it that way. Some of the colleagues I work with are much more focused on policy. Some of them are more focused on business and, and on the tech sector in the innovation and enterprise area. And some of them are more focused on the creative industries, society and the cultural area. But I think the important thing to remember is that there are linkages across all of these areas, across these three blocks, if you like, that I've put here. And each of them can feed into one another in very different ways. And um, I think a lot of us tend to think about policy as something that is in a hierarchical mode dictating to us about what happens. And sometimes I think we forget that research can inform and affect policy and shape policy. And lots of the best research by colleagues I've worked with over my whole career has done that in, in different areas, in areas as diverse as entrepreneurial and innovation work that I focus on to areas around the treatment of women and the treatment of a, an area like violence against women and equal pay. So it, it really is a diverse area and, and I'm very much interested in work related to policy that informs regional, national and global agendas. Um, so I think again, it's, it's about building these blocks into one's thinking about the dynamics of excellent outcomes and bringing research in a close relationship to um, real world outcomes, as I say, but in very, very diverse ways. And I think it is that diversity that's very exciting as a researcher to think about. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to say a bit about here is about my work is very much on ecosystem um, and very much around innovation and enterprise widely defined, including in the creative industries. And I think it's quite interesting to think about unpacking the impact um, uh, ecosystem so that we are able to think about it in a more granular way. And it does relate centrally to me for, to the issues around being an academic as part of a learning and knowledge exchange community. 
So it's about working with different partners and in different ways um, on challenges that exist. So I've already mentioned the whole policy area. I think a lot of this work, this work has been and continues to expand in a real engagement with key policy trajectories. You know, what kinds of policies are needed and, and how they should be applied. Um, because again, you can unpack the policy area into different um, aspects. You know, who should be engaged in policy formation and debates, methodologies for policy. There's a, there's a lot of scope there to be involved. Another area that's, that's less talked about that I'm more and more interested in is, is the whole idea of thought leadership as integral to external profile. When you work with stakeholders, I think that opens up doorways to be a participant and in thought leadership. And I do think for universities, this is increasingly important in my view, that colleagues are seen as part of that thought leadership ecosystem. Um, and I think that that is, is in, in growing importance. We see that, we saw it very much in the COVID scenario, wonderful profiling of academic work as something that's very much part of the how as well as the what, which I think is really important. There's a lot of scope for innovation in partnership work um, to achieve excellence in new ways. So, so I'm, I might call that enabling stakeholders to maybe learn how to do things in new ways, to draw on different areas of knowledge or forms of practice to help them even do what they do in existing terms in, in new ways that might be more efficient more innovative, more exciting, more engaging for their client base. Uh, so that's another interesting area. And of course, all of these speak to transdisciplinary focus. Transdisciplinarity is something that more and more academics are expert in, they're engaged with, and I think excited by. And um, you'll find in lots of areas of practice that there is growing understanding of this, there is growing interest in it, but I think that there's a lot of expertise within the academy that we can actually share externally to help people understand what transdisciplinarity is and what its function is. Uh, so just finally, I'll say a little bit about having a full cycle approach to collaborative excellence. This is one way I kind of capture what I think researchers practice and understanding um, practice as research is about because I think this is an area that is, is growing in terms of awareness, I would say in academia, but I think we probably need to do a lot more work on it. And that is understanding that working in partnership is about if what you might call end-to-end -end delivery. So if we are thinking about an interest we have or a project we want to develop, I think that really having stakeholders involved at the ground level in developing the research questions is part of um, the achieving excellence. So it, it's right at that early stage, not just thinking about it in your own head or thinking about it with just in the research. Talk to stakeholders who are involved in this area about what, what they need, what is useful to them. And then in designing methodologies, a lot of my work has been in designing methodologies within the startup environment that are suited to that environment, um, that are actually meaningful uh, to the people involved in it and that actually help them to develop themselves. And then an area that's often overlooked um, in relationship to some of what Gillen was saying at the, uh, in, at the beginning here is the whole dissemination area. Most of us are aware that a lot of the excellence in academic work is quite time sensitive. And a lot of the quality of what we deliver does take extended timeframes often. If we think about our books that we write, our monographs, they develop over many, many years. And this excellence is precious to us and really important to other researchers and students. But we know about the timescales in contemporary life. And we saw this in COVID, a fantastic case study of how time sensitive, gosh, it was life and death for the researchers to come up with the, with, um, the vaccines and the ways of delivering them, the whole cycle. So it's a wonderful case study to help us understand that we need to think in other 
time frames as well. And in what I do, which I tend to refer to as applied research, I'm thinking about dissemination of outcomes in a, a quite a time scale manner so that whatever outcomes I can share in whatever form is appropriate through the different stages and life cycle of the work that I'm doing, I seek to do that, whether in briefings or sharing it in presentations or uh, documents that actually make the knowledge available to people um, and, and just being sensitive to the, to the needs of those beyond the academy and the timescales they work with. And again, some of this can be challenging, but I think it, I find it also very exciting. And I think that the whole aspect of the way we share knowledge, the way we work in a knowledge exchange mode can add so much excellence and new understanding to the way that we do our work and the ways that we think about it. Um, I mentioned my LinkedIn page. You will find on there that I've, I, I uploaded, I've uploaded my Fusebox report, which is on the development of entrepreneurs. I've uploaded my Creative Ramsgate report there, which looks at the creative sector in Ramsgate. And there's other material there that I think that you will find um, interesting in terms of actually showing what this kind of work is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gillian. Um, and as you will see, um, participants, there's um, lots of information going up in the chat box um, with links to Gillian's biogs and her LinkedIn page. And we'll do the same for Pam in a minute. Um, Gillian, fantastic. Thank you. I think your um, a few things broke through for me then, popped in my head, particularly using the metaphor of the time sensitiveness of the research and output that had to happen for the COVID vaccine side. And it shows, you know, really puts you on the, on the peg, really, actually, about how things have to move forward. And also, and maybe we'll get a chance to come back to this, what are partnerships yet? And how do partnerships you know, really collaborate and how do we really partner with stakeholders out there and engage, as you said, from the beginning of your research of the key points. So, um, because I think often, um, not just in, in ac academia, but today partnerships can be very shallow and quite fake, and that just doesn't lead to um, knowledge exchange in the right way. So anyway, Pam, may I ask you now to share with us, um, Pam Bernard, um, and I'll turn my video off, so we'll leave you in charge. Thank you. So uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for this invitation to spend some time with you today, really uh, exploring a passion, a privilege, and a practice in terms of practices research exchange, knowledge exchange, but also knowledge creation and mobilization. And this beautiful word, I actually think it's a beautiful word. Uh, maybe we can talk about why, but impact is so central to human creativity and sustainability on this earth if we are to uh, sustain and maintain our presence here in the way that we are, impact, rupture, change, chance, and the idea of generating change that has a sustainable and positive way requires us to see and do differently. And so in this next 10 minutes, I'm going to take you on a journey with me, saying that practice as research, which is very often like AI, a, a, a co-authoring, a way of creating uh, in its own right, a tool for collaborative assistance is such as AI, but the practice as research really can't be decoupled. They, they are a partnership and they are fused together in very important ways in order to augment future making, you know, future making, as a career, future making careers, but also educations and hence creativities, which is another word for co-authoring change. Now, AI, you know, is used to, uh, to develop content creation, information analysis, content enhancement, 
information extraction, information data compression. And it is absolutely a partnership between humans and non-humans. And in this way, we see here, for example, my doctoral student Genevieve Smith-Nunz, her research draws across dance, performance, lighting design, video production, VR, digital ethics and coding, transdisciplinary. And it combines classical ballet with computing. And the whole idea is for secondary school students to engage in computer science, engage in and make with, indeed create with technology, AI and the subject itself. And so in looking also at these medical doctors who are also in an education setting, they're using a hologram with patients in mixed reality, learning environments that transform medical training. Now this transformation of education, of practice as research, practice through research, practice in research, but bringing practice research together is the key to this idea of, of uh, impact, which I'll, I'll come back to. If we look again, think about just, just for a second, just do some possibility thinking around impact and where we see impact every day. You know, we are impacted every day by policy, by practice, through research, especially during the last two years, three years. And if we think about impact as, a, as a, this picture, as a metaphor, thinking about, and I know it's certainly for my career, I've had three careers, uh, you know, I hope to have four and five, uh, a squiggly career, which is, uh, I'll come back to later. But there's distinct kinds of impact. And here, if we look at this, is this a ripple or is this a splash? You know, thinking about the metaphors as ripples and splash, impact ripples are subtle and they're, they're small scale, moving away from the source of movement ev over time, moving away from the source of the impact over time and space to effect change on their own surroundings. So important to think, what does that look like in practice as research? Or looking at impact splash, by contrast, which is designed to produce an immediate transformative effect. And these are aimed for and planned from an early stage in the research process. And that early stage in the research process is exactly what happens with practice as research, because whoever you're practicing with, a are the stakeholders, they are the partners, they are the co-researchers the, and co-authoring change. And those waves form a splash and impact around the site as well. Now let's come back to that idea shortly. So at the moment, maximizing the impact with practices research, how do we maximize the impact and as a REF panelist this year, well, last year and this year, you know, seeing how we, I think, really need to up our game in terms of making very clear in whatever genre you're researching and writing site or setting, that we write impactful articles, impactful articles, and we publish these in impactful places and that we actually turn our research reports into impactful practices. And in doing this within institutional, within entrepreneurial universities. And universities need to be entrepreneurial in these times. So maximizing the impact, promoting, and, and creating a way that really shows the influence and the benefit in academia and beyond academia. I know I will talk a little later 
uh, but just in case I run out of time, I think of the institutions that actually research themselves, that, that have a researcher constantly making um, bids to get research money from research councils to research the institution. And the first person that did this in the 70s was Janet Mills at the Royal College of Music. And she asked them for a table and chair and an internet connection. And from there, she won ESRC, AHRC and other bids that researched the institution. And that itself really showed, I think, one of the first institutions to be an entrepreneurial institution in order to change from within. Uh, very, very exciting and inspiring and still is. And this particular slide is, I'm just going to go a little bit um, academic and a bit scholarly at this point, despite the fact I am an artist and a musician and, you know, do all the other things. But for the moment, this is an article that ended up, you know, the last page showed really something that was described as impactful because it's written, uh, co-authored by um, me, two other um, uh, 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 teachers on the EDD at Cambridge and two students who were doing the EDD. So we were researching with the cohort in the institution and we were looking at professions of, you know, these are people who are uh, physiotherapists doing a professional doctorate. They're, they're coaches, they are head teachers, they are, um, in some cases, they can be medicine doctors uh, that are researching from inside their practice. And they are, as researching professionals, in partnership with their own workplace, they're in partnership with their own university, and they are sourcing policy change. They're analyzing policy action, poly and policy analysis processes, and engaging in policy change from the day that they start. And so you get this sort of um, really acting as public scholars in an ecosystem that produces, uses, and mobilizes knowledge creation in concern with broader structures and struggles, of course, you know, in terms of the institution or the organization and political shifts. And it's very important to think about how, how does this interaction work between practice theory, policy and research? They are interconnected. They're like, it's a marriage. They should not be separated. It's a collaborative enterprise. And we see within this figure, that collaborative enterprise between the workplace, the university, practice and theory, but also policy, policy thinking, a curriculum is a policy and that policy can change as the research progresses in a, a creative ecology. This requires multiple kinds of authoring, co-authoring, multiple kinds of forms of authoring and mediating modalities like technology changes everything, as does the temporality, how long one has and the nature of the practices and within this an institution or an organization or an industry has to really enact plasticity and in order to create a future making uh, a set of strategies that's future making because if you're just getting ready for the future I'm sorry it's going to pass you by we know that a change is happening so fast that the work force where jobs are not guaranteed that we there are 60 percent of the future occupations will be gone in about a decade so we need to think differently we need to do differently and we need to think that there's distributed creativity there's frugal creativity there's transdisciplinary creativity which co-authors the, the practice and the form of authorship and the modalities differently. And if you look at all of those creative industries, you would see that different forms of authorship operate very differently in different sectors. And so now we're thinking, what are careers? Whose career? How does the career unfold? It used to be portfolio careers and then became protean. And then we were writing about boundaryless careers. And now we're seeing 
the uh, Y, Z, uh, Gen, Z, Gen, uh, really enacting squiggly careers. So back to this idea of a creative ecology, an entrepreneurial university that is going to have an impact from within. It's going to make a splash and it's going to do more than a, just you know, a, a, a splash and a ripple so that it ripples out to other universities and to other places as well as this idea of the creator in its own right involving AI and the as a collaborator in the process designing to augment human creativity. Now let me invite you to finish with the idea of a rebel yell. This book is going to, I'm being absolutely ruthlessly self-promotive here, but there's 33 authors in this edited book and three other co-editors and I feel I can do this. It's doing rebellious research in and beyond the academy and we're inviting people to write in different registers and voices, tempos and volumes and to feature their thinking and their voice differently and to be given the permission to do this with impact. And it materializes a we-ness, a we-ness, more than an I-ness, but a we-ness, a collaborative communal space. And that in this writing, the message and the meaning becomes impactful because it ruptures the norm. And with that in mind, here are some references that of people that I've worked with and I do a lot of collaborative work because that's where the rupture happens. And so I thank you so much for your attention and I'll finish right there. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Pam. Fantastic, both of you. And Gillian, can I get you to um, join us again um, with your video and mic on? Um, Fantastic. So, I mean, just incredible wealth of information there. And I think really interesting to get this overview from both of you, actually, coming so clearly in about the ecology of the University of the Academy itself and actually how that in itself, that ecosystem in itself has to be part of the whole enabling of impact out output as such. So um, now I'm looking and seeing not, not any questions in the chat box yet, but I um, chat or, or questions and answers box. If you can, great, um, add some in, but no, not to worry because I've got definitely quite a few things I'd like to um, bring up with both of you um, to, to talk a little bit further. And the, the first one of those actually is that this very interesting um, uh, that both of you mentioned and I'm well aware of, but I think isn't completely in the flow yet of us all, but that actually impact in itself, um, you know, it doesn't exist in itself. We have this whole ecosystem to do around it, how to get there, et cetera. But when you do have impact, it's future making. It is about future. And I was wondering whether you two could talk a little bit more about that, that, that fact that actually the, the ripple, Pam, the ripple effect that you have, the, the, it, or the splash, yeah, and Gillian, you, you've talked about this too, and the shift changes that, into policy, for example, that we're talking about the, 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 our research having an impact into the future. Is that where you're both feeling that we, it's coming from? It has to go, it has to go, that's what I mean. So maybe I can go, Pam, you first. Okay, uh, yeah. I don't think it's into the future. I think it's of the future. And that's the difference. You know, people speak about uh, readiness. Readiness for what? I mean, you know, readiness for employment for five-year-olds at this point in time, what are they getting ready for? It's gonna be a very different world as it is now. I mean, this pace of change, every everything is always changing, but it's the rapid, the rate of acceleration that is changing and the partnership with technology that humans and non-humans are working in partnership uh, it's not about a human exceptionalism like it used to be you know I've got a bit of um who's this guy here you'll all recognize this man Leonardo da Vinci who's a polymath and you know developed this in the renaissance it's the forerunner to the to the helicopter I mean really and he he drew images of water hitting water 
multiple times in order to get to understand the physics of it. And of course, he drew the Vitruvian man, you know, where, where it's sort of somewhere between science and arts. Now, the point I'm getting at here is that we are now rethinking transdisciplinarity, absolutely, as you were saying, Gillian, in the real world practice, that's what they do is transdisciplinarity. It's not siloed. So education has to think about future making with children developing steam gardens, not outdoor education, but steam gardens that bring science education, uh, bring uh, sustainability, food production, sound and sonic applications of why nature comes and why it doesn't, and being scientists you know, in, in the field, as it were, with, and you can, if you Google steam garden, you'll see researchers, science researchers, and arts researchers working together um, in Scotland on that. So it's this transdisciplinary uh, uh, practices that flip how we educate so that we're not educating for children becoming part of the world. They are in the world of the world now, and they are needing to be educated in terms of future making themselves. My answer. Okay, so so there we. That's really helpful, actually, to actually have that in in our heads about you know thinking about a five year old today and actually the future making that we are in control of at this point um, uh, and how that. Um, we maybe just need to keep that five-year-old picture in our head and, you know, of, of where, where we're taking them, what's going to be there then, you know. So, Gillian, um, to come to you on that um, impact and future question. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of refer back as well to, to Pam's presentation partly in the sense that part of what she's talking about is the role of education and the skills that are needed and um, Jelaine, you'll know from a recent presentation we were involved in that I'm, I'm very interested in the 21st century skill set and how it's, it's, it is about competences, but it's also about character and the ability to mix the two. Um, so she's talking about that area, but, she, uh, but, but I think the way that she's talking about the future making and transdisciplinarity also, to me, speaks to the challenge that the impact agenda has presented for many of us as academics on the ground in, in the sense of what expertise is and how you develop it. Because part of the world that Pam so articulately maps out and works in, and I do to some extent myself, is in the thick of the complexities that the world is, is now. You know, I mean, that, that, Part of what Pam's talking about is, is how much more complex the world has become in the last hundred years and beyond, okay, and how that seems to be speeding up and how do we cope with that. And I think that academics have been challenged by that as much as corporations have um, dramatically. The big institutions, government, have been challenged by it most, and again, we've seen it in COVID. I'm in a way quite lucky to have worked very heavily. I was an entrepreneur myself in my 20s a long time ago, and I work in the entrepreneurial sector where startups take small bite-sized things and work that problem to come up with a really um, good solution to it. Um, and they have to do so in collaboration often across skill sets. But, but one, a lot of the lessons I've learned are about them taking that, that bite-sized thing and really focusing on it. And I think part of what the new impact discussion should be about and part of what partnership and stakeholder should be about is, is, is helping us as academic experts cope with the complexity and have a place in that complexity that we feel confident about and that we feel safe in and that we feel excited by. And part of that is preserving some of the history of what we do. As I said earlier, academics write the most authoritative books, you know, and that takes a long time and a lot of expertise. And we want to hold on to that. We don't want to lose that. And, and I would defend that dramatically. 
But I think that our work is, for many of us, much more of a mosaic beyond that where we are doing more applied work and more short time based work where we can share some of that knowledge because the world needs it. And Jelaine mentioned earlier the important thing about what kind of partnerships. She's absolutely right to strike on that, because just like we talk about in the startup sector a lot, these need to be authentic. These need to be authentic to you as an academic, your expertise, your commitments, your interests. And as someone who sat on a REF panel and assessed impact case studies and seen the breadth of them across all sorts of different areas of policy and in the startup area, in the creative sector, in the community sector, I know that there's a huge spectrum out there that, that, that we can be engaged in authentically. So I think that, you, you know, we do need to develop skills to be able to work with partners flexibly and in real time. We saw this with COVID and I really do think, you know, it's a really great terrain, thinking terrain for all of us, yeah, about what, what, how, what, uh, the world that Pam's describing, basically, and the challenges it presents. But, but academics have the space to develop partnerships with entities, whether they're corporates or startups or charities, and to actually develop research, which, which is co-authored, as Pam's terminology is spot on, yeah, and actually is authentic. And I think it's, it's been really difficult for a lot of us in the academic sector that the, the impact agenda seems to be imposed on us when a lot of us were already doing it. it just we weren't calling it that. And a lot of us were concerned that our work didn't fit into that. Collaborative possibilities that Pam was talking about allow us to find our, our way in that. And it will be different for all of us. It's not one size fits all. Well, no, thank you. That's really helpful and actually partly answers a couple of the questions that have come up in, um, in the chat room and the, and the question box. One is actually from Dave Hockham, who's a co-director with me for the Clay Research Group. Dave, David has said, uh, David, Dave, has said, I'm looking at the rebellious research, Pam, bringing that up, but saying being given permission to write and research in different ways sounds like a way to include that include wider types of practitioners in the research beyond the academy and within co-created research practice. So I think that, um, David, you're absolutely right there. Um, and that's followed through by Jules Petit saying, I agree, institutional procedural processes seem to hamper this. I'm taking a sabbatical in order to find this space. And Jules says this also in the chat, really interested in your points about being given permission to give a different voice, but sadly, it seems that in academia, most agency is attributed to operating within the politics of an institution or procedural confines of application processes for funding. And they're asking there if we can add to that. And I actually will add to that and back that up because I do think that um, so often, the flow of what one is doing, the passion, the direction, the, the actual, like you say, the authentic partnerships that come about, Gillian, and you're on it, you know, you're going for it. There's something to come out there. And suddenly, either within the funding scenarios or within the, 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 the politics or the rules within institutions, it just is, you're, you're just blocked, not blocked in a way which is... Um, uh, uh, stopping you doing something but it, it's it's telling you how to do it which isn't necessarily the flow that's needed particularly in relationship to out, outside partnerships um, and Pam you mentioned there and, and both of you I think about the time scale stuff that comes up all the time you know what an SME partner needs from a university what against how fast a university can work etc cetera, etc cetera. but I was wondering both of you a bit more about that the the, that, that the realism of the fact that you can really go, yeah, we've got it, yes, we've got, we'll go, we'll look for some funding. And then suddenly the funding or the institution is like, well, no, you can't do that. No, you've got to do it this way. No, it's got to fit in here. It's got, and those, I mean, I know that it's a realism, but have you got any hints to give us or anything to add to that? Uh, may I? Yes, when please. an offset inspector goes to a school and they give the school a rating, 
the schools that get, you know, great ratings are doing the, you know, meeting the criteria for outstanding, but my God, they're doing so much more. They're not just doing that. They're doing, you know, a whole ecology, to use my favourite word at the moment, a creative ecology that expands and enhances and augments the excellence of the education. If you just went to a school that was outstanding according to the criteria, it would not be the kind of original learning communities where they're making ripples and splashes all the time, where they're bringing in partners from the community and from the universities, where I know a primary school that brings the first year engineers into the school and the engineers come into the school and stay there for a week in a primary school. Of course, after that week, the children go home, say to their parents, I want to be an engineer. Yeah. And then you have architects go in and build and create and make for another week in another term in this same school. And the children say, I want to be an architect. But then they start thinking differently about what are we building? How are we building? And how should we make a world that's sustainable. Children are thinking about this. They are angry. They mm -hmm. So they should be. I am too, because we've let that happen. And we've let it happen in certain ways. Another example, where NHS ventilators fit with children that have uh, issues with breathing, and the ventilators are not very smart. They're not, they're not cool. They're not hip. So they gave the project to a secondary school design and tech class saying design an engineer a prototype so engineers came into the school talking about you know thinking uh, about how to non to go to unfixate our design thinking to to release ways of thinking differently and then they were set with their design and tech teacher to design a whole range of different ways of, of really changing these kind of ventilator uh, uh, things for children. The NHS is trialing prototypes. Wow. Now that's education, future making education, right. where you've and got all these that's... partners coming from all over the place. It's not just the institution itself. So when you say yeah. last okay. point, academia, I mean, I, I don't think of this sort of tower. I don't think of a tower anymore. I think of academia having this ripple effect right out into the community yeah. and beyond and people coming in as well. Yeah, okay. Now that's helpful. So that, that's a, a, a good image in my head, that ripple and how, you know, if you can ripple out to even like you say, into, you know, engineers going into primary schools and really working with them on something which is for them, yeah, and which is for the future. And that ripple back in to, um, to shifting policies and thinking. So, but, but Gillian, can I come to you on that about this whole thing of um, how, how do we deal with then the, the issue of a, within the institution that might not fit into the ways yeah. that the institutions are run. Yeah, this is this is right in my ballpark because yeah, yeah. I, my recent experience has been in senior management in institutions, yes. and I'm very committed to that. So I'm afraid I just have to say very practically and very straightforwardly that institutional parameters they are part of the real world context that we work in. Like Pam, I think there's a lot of scope around and about those. I've certainly found that in my own career. There's a lot of scope for creativity so that you're not confined totally by those parameters. But, um, you know, I hope I won't seem too unradical in a way of saying that I, I see those parameters as part of the context. So, yes, we're employed by institutions. We're not freelancers. We're employed by institutions um, and they have strategies and priorities and clearly um, trying to make your work link to and be relevant to those strategies is, is part of the possibilities. It will be easier for some than others. And again, it is about finding your place, but collaborations, if you're 
you overtly don't fit in, then perhaps you can be part of other collaborations. I'm very can do, I'm afraid. I'm I'm an I'm an entrepreneur through and through. It's can do. What can you do? What are your your really authentic goals? And how can you be as creative as possible to to do what Pam says? I don't quite um, sort of use the term of ripple, but it's the same idea. You know, mm, yeah. it, it's what you can do. And I do think your institutional context is part of that starting point. And let's, we don't have to be naive here. Institutions vary enormously. The elitist nature of those institutions, the resources they have. I've been very privileged to work across the HE sector in that way. So I'm familiar with all of them. And I have seen brilliant work done in all of them. And I've seen that on the REF panel. There's no different, it's about the nature of the work and the academic yeah. commitment and excellence. So it is the art of the possible, but I think there is a lot that is possible. And I think that sources of funding are getting tougher and tougher, particularly in the arts and social sciences areas, which drives us in the direction that um, Pam outlined of, of working with science, which many people want to do anyway. But again, I would just say there's lots of different ways of working with science. And many of them are very creative as, I mean, that's Jelaine, she's, a, she's an icon in that area, so she knows well. So, I mean, it, 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 and, and again, we can, we can seek mentoring from people who have that expertise to help us find those paths. Um, but it, it, but it, even, it, you know, even yeah. for myself, and yes, I do work um, massively into public impact and policy impact, yeah, and I'm uh, across a number of years, and it's taken me time, obviously, to get there, like with you too, you know, with senior years. Um, I still find often that the natural flow or evolution of um, uh, an, uh, you know, an idea, research idea, right through you know, the natural partnerships forming, and then actually this is, wow, this really could go somewhere, is often very held back by slightly old-fashioned thinking within the funding system, or like, um, old-fashioned might not be the right word, not it's again it's like regulation like government regulation around tech it can't move fast enough to actually keep up with some of the clear uh, metaphors that you two are bringing up today like the ripple effect like the ecosystem um agilian that you talk about it's you know you might have around a particular theme or research area for you know a natural ecosystem comes into place and it's just perfect but it just won't fit in to no, the way that actually but, that this yeah. is being thought about. What, yeah. How I would respond to that is something that you've heard me talk about in other contexts. I think there's a lot of learning that needs to go on within university senior management and within the HE sector about becoming fitter and fitter for purpose. And I think some of that learning will come out of the new um, knowledge exchange framework, which, which has a particular character but I think we'll will help move universities into that zone. But I'm I'm very happy to be upfront and say my aspirations in senior management are to be part of that change. But that that is not saying, Jelaine, that I can make the university sector work for every individual academic. This is not <laughs> yeah. this is yeah. not the world we live in. And 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 I think a lot of academics really understand that. But the fact that we all need help to innovate. I think applies to us on the ground and it absolutely applies to very traditional institutions like like those that exist in the HE sector. I think it's about this, the, in my head suddenly it's coming an image of uh, um, partly linked to your first slide, Gillian, about that knowledge flow both ways yeah, that yeah. we have to get. And Jackie yeah. Richards, Dr. Jackie Richards has added into the questions now, she's working with active older people participating in creative dance and challenging perceptions with her research. And she says, how, how can assumptions and stereotypes be overcome where transdisciplinary research from work-based transdisciplinary doctorates are creating new knowledge from their practice and research projects that challenges existing knowledge and practice? 
And so really the challenge, and it actually links into another thing I wanted to bring up is this word originality. Yeah, original, it comes up with the ref a lot. Originality, significance and rigor are the three key words linked to impact in the ref, you know. And Jackie there in a way is saying, so how do we actually work from the work-based transdisciplinary doctorate into challenging existing knowledge and practice, which may well be in the institutional-based trans transdisciplinary doctorate or transdisciplinary research base. So again, it's this two-way. How do we actually, it's a kind of figure of eight, isn't it? That we've got to get working completely throughout the whole. Pam, I don't know do if I have you. I, th I think uh, I think Jackie's talking about a, a professional doctorate, an ed D, and and you know the, more often the practices, you know, the research practice is practices research or research is practice. Sometimes it's called participatory research, but it's about institutional change, and it starts with policy. In term, if you consider that a policy is the mechanism through which values are authored, formulated, and mobilized than just looking at the policy that you're working to in the environment that you're in and having brainstorming meetings, you know, focus group discussions with the people that work in that organization to, to co-author, to co-create, to uh, play around with, you know, pushing back against whatever's really in, inhibiting and challenging and constraining that institution from becoming more entrepreneurial. That is opening okay. it up, rupturing it and allowing, you know, authoring of new cre knowledge mm. creation and, and change, innovation. So we are change. talking a kind of much more of a figure of eight. And this is fascinating, actually. And I think we could talk about this for another hour because I, I know we've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to have to wrap it up. But I think that <coughs> it hadn't, really clicked in my head before but actually and I'm not sure this would work you know that my impact that went in for the ref or the kef could be that I'd made a change in my university yeah I'm not sure that what well, would that be put in my impact case study is that I've made major changes in the university I'm based in <laughs> anyway I, I, we, we put in we put in <coughs> a, new, a new case there had never been a case like this before we put in the university of cambridge primary school as a case and we had to provide evidence that it had made a ripple and a splash mm -hmm. nationally la re locally regionally nationally internationally and that school had been gathering data you know, from its international partners and from all sorts of practices and, you know, looking outward. It's an outward looking um, kind of creating different models for change, really. It's, it's, a, it's a living inquiry, the whole school. So I think it's something yeah, you've got okay. to prepare for, gather your data and show impact over time. Well, Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I think we need to do another one of these with you too, because there's so many more things I've got on my list and I can, oh, there's another question that's come up in the chat box. It's quite late. Oh, Jackie, you can read that one, Pam and, um, uh, and uh, Gillian separately. So, because I need to wrap up now. And you know, I wanted to come to that word originality. I wanted to come to the word transform transformative and how that's been looked at today and entrepreneurship as well to unpack that a bit more in relationship to the institutions. Um, but we will find a way to do that, yeah, um, in future discussions. But the first thing I need to do to wrap up is to, um, well, one, thank you to very much, Gillian and Pam, for your time, for your energy and excellent wisdom actually in thinking and in mo in this modern way of this kind of figure of eight around our our impact and our um, practice as research and then to thank also um, Susanna Lowell and Fakhar Azar who are behind the scenes here making this all run really smoothly thank you very much the Greenwich events team there and also just to point out to everyone that there is a second uh, park cafe in this little series we're doing now and hopefully onwards too from the clay research group and you can sign up to that there's still time and there it has popped up in the chat box thank you Suzanne um, it's actually more of a practical workshop and this is going to be led by my co-director for clay Dave Hockham at Bathway Theatre in Woolwich, which is our theatre site for Greenwich, um, on the 2nd of March. And it's a daytime event, actually. So and as part of that event, you're going to meet colleagues and partners 
that's what we're talking about here, internal and external, and from across subject areas, into, into definitely interdisciplinary, Clay is an interdisciplinary group, and look to identify potential future cross-disciplinary projects. And we're pleased to actually announce that from our um, Greenwich Research and, on, and Enterprise funding, we can actually um, uh, say now that there will be two pilot project grants, which will be of 3,000 each, which will be to be used before, before July, the end of July. And we're looking from this day, from the Park Cafe too, if you attend, for seed applications towards this kind of mix of internal and external partners towards those little seeding grants. And then Greenwich will work onwards to help with the funding of those projects forward. So it's a kind of bounce, a catalyst point, which um, Dave's gonna lead us in a workshop on. So cross-disciplinary and looking at that future of knowledge exchange and, and participatory research and definitely internal and external partners together. So some nice thank yous in the site, in the chat box there, and also the link to sign up for the 2nd of March um, for Dave's workshop at Bathway. And actually also we've got a performing oral history symposium between the 11th and 13th of April, which are both online and physical. So a hybrid event, which I'm really supportive of because of inclusivity post this, um, this, this very strange experimental time we've had, but which has meant a lot more people have been able to hang into things. So great, thank you again. Sorry, we've gone a minute or so over. Um, good luck for the rest of the day, everybody. And thanks very much again, Gillian and Pam. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.